Here we are in Daniel. We're actually getting to the what people refer to as the 70 weeks. You will discover tonight that that's really not what the Hebrew Bible calls it. The Hebrew Bible calls it 77s. In uh, Daniel 9. Actually, if you have a New American Standard, let's see. I, let's say I looked at this. I, I looked this up in uh, somewhere in your paper. You uh, in the NAS? It's seventy weeks. In the NIV, it's seventy sevens, which kind of surprised me. King James is seventy weeks, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's seventy sevens. The word "week" is not in it at all. So we'll explain that tonight, why it is. But in my NAS, it says 70 weeks or 77s have been decreed for your people in your holy city. Now watch these six things. Watch these six things. To finish transgressions, to make an, an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. You see all those twos? There's six of them. Those six things have to be done in the 77s. They have to be, th th these are the things that have to be completed in the 77s. Okay? And look, it says that the 77s have been decreed for your people, the Jews, and for their holy city, Jerusalem. You understand that? So these are the things that are essential to complete the 77s for the people of Israel. Okay? That should be clear. Should not that be clear? Decreed? Okay. And verse 25. So... And, of course, this is what Daniel is dealing with, is the priest nation of Israel in, ba in captivity. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that would be Ezra and Nehemiah period, until the Messiah, the prince, that's Christ, we know him as Jesus Christ, there will be seven weeks and 62 or you've got, remember the word weak is not in there, okay? So you got seven sevens, and you have 62 sevens, is what you have. It would be built again, and with plazas and moats, even in the times of distress. Now, if you want to know more about the times of distress or trouble, you can read Ezra and Nehemiah, and they'll tell you. Because those books are about this this period, uh, the seven sevens. After the sixty two weeks, the Messiah, that is, after the seven is completed and the sixty two is completed, do you understand? After the seven sevens and the sixty two sevens is completed, the Messiah Christ will be cut off. I he will be crucified. And have nothing. And the people of the prince, that's not the same prince as in verse 25. This is the prince, which is actually the Roman Empire. And he's, it's called that way because out of that is going to come the dictator of the revived Roman Empire called the Little Horn in the book of Daniel. Okay? You got to read the second chapter and seventh chapter to get that. But the people, it's the people of the prince. The people of the prince is the Roman Empire. The prince is the Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come, the prince who is, is to come, the Antichrist, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come like a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he 
will make a firm covenant with many for one week. He, the Antichrist, the prince out of the people that's going to come and destroy Israel. And they did it in 70 AD. They did this. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That, that means one seven years. One times seven. It's seven times seven. It is seven times 62. And it is seven times one. That's the 70 sevens. But in the middle of the week, all right, in the middle of the seven years, three and a half on one side, three and a half on the other side of the tribulation, you're well familiar with that, right? Then this Antichrist will establish himself and the ball game will be over. He will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolation. And you say, you know, the, the, you're familiar with, you, if you're not, well, we'll be doing all this study, but the abomination of desolation. He sets up the statue in the temple and requires worship. Will come one who makes desolation even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolation. And if you want to know about that, then you go to Revelation 19 and 20, and you'll see the end of the Antichrist. Right? All of that. It, it, this is pretty amazing. Daniel, we're talking about when he's given this, you remember Gabriel came to him and laid this all out, right? I mean, when now we're in our... I guess fourth lesson in Daniel before I ever got here <clears throat> and should have spent more time than this because if you don't know chapter 2 and chapter 7, a eh, little bit of trouble here. <clears throat> but anyhow, what is amazing is that Daniel, who was taken captive in 605 B.C. by the Babylonians, is now... Babylon's been conquered by Medo-Persians, and he's now under their rule. <laughs> and he is struggling to know about the 70 years of captivity that Jeremiah wrote about, his pastor who sent from the whole land doctrines into them. He's trying to figure all this out. Gabriel comes to explain it when he does he pops this thing all, listen to me now, this is amazing to me. The revelation that he gave him, a vision and a revelation of, of Messianic history, he popped that from the Babylonian captivity all the way to the millennial age. Verse 24, 25, 26, and 27. That is amazing. That is amazing. And if you, if you study Messianic history, that is the period that is gigantic. I mean, everything is starting to snowball now. The Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and then what was prophesied. See, in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream nobody could answer. He called in da uh, Daniel, and Daniel gave him, told, gave him history of four kingdoms that would take you to Christ. Four kingdoms. He, he, he prophesied, uh, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar, and he told King Kene Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to like what you just dreamed, but here it is. Babylon's going to be swallowed up by the Medo-Persians, and the Persians are going to be swallowed up by the, um, by the Greco-Macedonians, and they're going to be swallowed up by Rome. And out of the Rome, and that's going to go down, there's going to be a gap in that history, and out of Rome is going to come the little horn which is the Antichrist that's going to swallow up three of the ten kingdoms that have been a federation, and boy, it is going to smoke in the Middle East. There's nothing going on over there now compared to what's going to go on. 
I mean, it's just amazing. This little book, you know, what, it's got 12 chapters? That little book is dynamite. As far as Messianic history, it's dynamite. So, in, in Daniel 2, you'll read that, that the four kingdoms are identified by a statue. And then when the seventh chapter comes, they're identified by beast, by animals. <clears throat> Real important for you to look at it. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> I mean, and boy, you really have to be, I have never, never studied so much in all of my life. I mean, I have really studied a lot. <laughs> Well, anyhow, remember in our previous studies, Daniel was in his quiet time. He had been studying out of Jeremiah 25. We know that by, by how he described it. He was, and it was well worth your time to read Jeremiah 25. A guy like me has to read it and exegete it and do all that stuff. You know, all you got to do is read it. But Jeremiah 25, he's reading Jeremiah 25 because he wants to know more specifics, details on the, on the Babylonian captivity. And he discovers that it's a 70-year uh, captivity, and therefore he is now wondering what happens now because we got to be getting close, right? Yeah, he, he realizes he's got to be getting close to this. So... He's up in age. He went as a kid, now he's up in age. So, you know, 70 years, let's see. I mean, whoa. So, in the, and so he begins to pray to the Father about what he's been reading in regard to the people of Israel in bondage and what's next on the slate. Agreed? Because we read that prayer. We, we read 19, out of the ninth chapter, there are 19 verses on, in, in regard, to that, regard to that prayer. And in the in the middle of that prayer, someplace in the midst of that, man, that was abound to good. That was set up. To, listen, when he got through through that prayer and Gabriel's time with him, he was he was completely exhausted. And, and, but anyhow, it, in the midst of his prayer over this thing, Gabriel shows up in a vision. Gabriel shows up and lays this whole thing out. Now, we studied his appearance in the ninth chapter, verses 20 through 23. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, that's pretty amazing itself. And he, you remember, he spoke to Daniel in terms of a very special spiritual growth maturity. We call it super grace around here. And you remember, he, he referred to him that way. And he is going to refer to him all the rest of the time that way. And that's a title God gave Daniel, nobody else. And once, Daniel, once Gabriel began to give it to Daniel, then, okay. That's how, that's how then Gabriel says, okay, I'm going to give you understanding and insight through this vision. He said, I've come with the answer of you. Remember, I've come with the answer to your prayer about the 70 years. That's how you get the 77s. Oh, yeah, I'm just warming up. Thank you, though. <laughs> Thank you. He could, tell. He, could, he, he could feel my engine, couldn't he? All right, I'm going to take your advice, William. Because I did feel my engine start to wrap up. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Bring everybody else with your engine in. All right? Classroom etiquette, you have to be spiritual. A spiritual book for spiritual people. You got to study it. You got to study it under the ministry of the Spirit. You got to live it. You got to learn it and live it, both under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's an easy deal for you because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 and 20, 6, 19 and 20 says, what, don't you know that your bodies become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there? And that happened because you live in the church age. Boom, at the point of salvation, he took up residence. Your body is now the temple of God, the naos, the place where atonement has taken place. I mean, that's so, 
So that's who you are. You're a believer priest. First Peter 2, you're a priest. It's your responsibility to take care of your priesthood and to take care of your temple. One of the ways you do it as a believer is to confess sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. What does that mean? That's not for salvation. That's for sanctification. That is to allow the Holy Spirit to set you apart. Now, you need to be set apart in this Bible study so that the Holy Spirit can minister you without interruption to teach you some relevant truths for your life. So, I'm going to give you a moment of silence with every head bowed and every eye closed to give you that privilege. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins should be confessed before you study the Bible. Both in learning and living, it's essential. Because you're told to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. So, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray that the people on the Internet, though they live maybe all over the world, it is important they understand the same etiquette that was required here. If they sat here, is required there. If they're not willing to do it, they just shut off whatever device they have and go on and do what they feel like they ought to be doing and not be distracted from this study because this is God's word to them. As much as if Gabriel came down, like he did with Daniel, and Daniel says, well, you know, Gabriel, I really don't have time for this now. I've got other things I need to do. I don't know that would have went over well with Gabriel. And so I pray that they would understand it would be more disrespectful with the third member of the Godhead living in their heart, and they have a chance to study the Bible, not to pay attention. So I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Well... There's great debate on when the 70 years started and ends. Some people take the 605 with the first deportation, but the problem with that, there's three deportations to Babylon. 605, 597, eight, uh, 586. So there's a real problem with that for guys like me. So for me, it's easier to understand when... The nation fell. It didn't fall in 605. It didn't fall in, it fell in 586. They went in there and it fell. I mean, they sacked it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar took all the gold and the riches out of the tabern uh, temple and, and it was kaput. He took everything, everything that was of value, people, everything that had value. And p young people had great value to Nebuchadnezzar and he took all the young people the really sharp young people who took him in the first one, and the second group, he grabbed them, and then the 30 came in, he didn't take nobody. And what was left was just shambles and, and just the very old and weak and poor. Oh, that was a tough day in the life of that people. Think how bad it was for those who, who left and had to leave these people behind, their grandparents and parents and people like that, people that were sick and needed them. And I mean, I mean, my heart just, I, I float all over the place when I, when I read this kind of a story. Um, but Daniel was one of those guys in the first trip out, 605. But for me, the fall of Israel is when time begins. The 70 years with me begins with the fifth cycle, according to Leviticus 26. And so I base my 70 years on the fall, and the 70 years would take me to 516. And for some people, that's, you know, it messes up their math, but, you know, I don't know how all that math works. Anyhow, I'm not good at math, so it don't bother me. Um, but anyhow, the 70 years. So when we get to Daniel, the ninth chapter, which our big chapter, when we get to the ninth chapter, verse 2, it talks about in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, and, he, and he's talking about a new ruler. There's a new sheriff in town. It's the Medo-Persians groups is in now. We got the Medes in with Darius, and, and then we're going to have Cyrus. And, and boy, I'll tell you, the, God raised up Babylon 
to put a serious, a serious hurt on Israel. <laughs> and then when they got ready to be released, he gave the most gentle nation you could ever be under with the Persians for Israel. I mean, Cyrus. I mean, do you realize under the Persians, the Jews are going to go back. They're going to be built. They're going to be funded. They're even given back. Everything that was taken from the temple is going to be restored to them. And in history, this period is called, under, uh, the, under the Persians, is called the Golden Age of the Jews. They're still in captivity. Oh, uh, yes, sir. You know, don't get worried about what's going on. God's in control of nations, just like people. No thing is too big for God. When you study the book of Daniel, there are so many big world powers floating in and out of this book that your mind gets boggled. <clears throat> world powers sent by God, client nations. He sends one client nation to put, that's what, you know, priest nation, you know, priest nation, client nation. He sends one, and nations come from God. They Nobody develops nations. They come out of Genesis 10 and 11, right? We'll talk more about that tomorrow night in world evangelism. <laughs> Man, they ain't no nations just pop up. They're decreed by God. They, God raises them and takes them down. You know, eh, listen, and... He raises one client nation just mean as a bulldog. I don't mean to despair bulldogs. <laughs> but to compare a bull, any bulldog to Babylon wouldn't be fair to the bulldog. But he raises, and they're mean as a hornet, boy. Uh, disparage hornets now. But they are really bad. They're bad people. And God sends them. He puts a serious, a serious, serious, serious. That's called the fifth cycle of discipline. Nobody but nobody would want to go into the fifth cycle. And you would think if you ever went under it first and had history on it. You know when the Jews, the Jews talk about the Nazis and they bring it up as a reminder, it does nothing. That ought to lead them to Christ. Does it lead them to Christ? They're the most, they're the dumbest group of people. Who, that's a, I don't care. I'll probably got, I doubt if I have any Jews listening to me out of Israel. But if you are, get saved. There's worse than, there's worse on earth as going to hell. And you'll sure do it if you reject his son, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that straight up. This group of people. So he sends it, and he puts them in bondage under the fifth. And when he gets ready to release them, he brings the Medes in, then brings the Persians in, and the Persians are just, I mean, they're just a pussycat compared to everybody else. Oh, no, no, they're conquerors. Don't misunderstand me. They put a sword to you and kill you. But boy, what a client nation they were for Israel. Let me tell you what you learned from that. Don't be anti-Semitic. If you're a nation out there and you're anti-Semitic, you're in deep trouble with God. The worst thing America could ever do, we, we have held our own and our light has shined because we have been pro-Israel. It's biblical. I hate it that they won't come to faith in Christ because it wouldn't affect their history at all. It wouldn't affect their history at all, but it would affect their life enormously. Their history is decreed. And it's decreed that they get saved by their son. He didn't send him. Listen, he said, I came to my own and my own rejected me. John 1, 11 through 13. What a sad day that was in his heart. Well, anyhow. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the numbers of years which were revealed, that's Jeremiah 25, which were revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, his pastor, for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. And that's where this all started. I'm in the ninth chapter when I make, 
make that statement. Now, Gabriel shows up, and he's going to explain the 70 years in panoramic view of Messianic history. <laughs> it is so good. This is so good. It's going to take me weeks to cover all this. Yeah, I'm going to cover it, but I mean, this is, well, anyhow. Gabriel appears to him and reveals the 77s. The 77s outline the directive will of God throughout Messianic history from the Babylonian captivity to the Millennial Age kingdom. The 77s is translated weeks, but it's not that in the Hebrew Bible. And so I wrote it out for you as it looks in the Hebrew Bible. And there are people here that have Hebrew Bibles and can read Hebrew. So, the 70, what I have in the first one, 70, that's how it looks in the Hebrew. And then I put it, in Hebrew you read from right to left. And then the word sevens actually means S. Now you, now you got to write a little bit. Yeah, I'm about, we're about to get your pencil warmed up in a minute. But this word sevens, as the way it's laid out, this word means period, period of sevens. A period of sevens is what this means in Hebrew. Seventies in a period of sevens. So when he makes this outline, here's what he's going to do. He's going to put seven, he's going to put 62, and he's going to put one. That's 70. That's 70. Then he tells you, to multiply it by seven. That's how that works. And you're going to wind up with 490. Now those, those, separate, those three things are very important because it's part of Messianic history from the Babylonian captivity forward. But that's how that works. And that's what the 77s mean. That you got these periods, 70, and they're periods of seven. And we know their years because that's what Babylon captivity was. But we know, we know. Listen, there's another thing. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. There, there's something. Now, we have already studied that this 70 business here is sabbatical. You remember that? Sabbatical. In other words, you know, Israel was set up on sabbatical. You got one in a week, then you got every seven years, then you got a jubilee business. All right, so we understood that, that, and he tells you that you didn't honor the Sabbath system, which was honoring his son, right? Mark 2.27, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. You didn't honor that. So all that shadow Christology, the temple, the holiday, all that shadow Christology. You didn't honor it. Therefore, you're going to go into 70 years because you didn't honor the Sabbath system to give the land a rest for 70 years. Remember that? Okay. See, if you're visiting with us tonight, you're for... You're for you're, you're, you're behind four lessons, but that's all right. You can play catch up. That's all right. Now, once you go to Leviticus 26, I want to show you the, another part. So that's one of the sevens, right? Because the Sabbath, see, that's a seven system. All right. There's another reason for the seven in the fifth cycle. And that's going to be found in Leviticus 26. So I want you to go there, and I'm just going to flash through here with you. I'm just going to go through this thing with you just a little bit for you to look. Now this, I pick Leviticus 26 because that's where it shows you the five cycles of divine discipline. All right, now it doesn't do Deuteronomy, but I'm, I'm picking uh, Leviticus for you because I want you to see something that um, da Daniel got uh, through Jeremiah 26. I'm going to show you key words. I'm just going to, I'm talking about the seven. Are you with me? Just the seven. All right, I'm in the 26th chapter. I want you, now, this is not in your paper. So if it's important to you, you better start writing. Leviticus 26, look at verse 18. He says, I will punish you seven times more. Now, you know what we are? We're, we, now, the, we, we, the first cycle doesn't have it. The first cycle, see, there are five cycles of divine discipline. The first cycle doesn't have this phrase. But the second cycle through the fifth cycle does have it. Because the first cycle comes out, it's a warning to get, get back with God. 
And if you don't, and it goes to the second cycle, then the first cycle, when it comes to the second cycle, gets revved up seven times. When it goes to the third cycle, it gets revved up seven times off the first and second, and out it goes. Now I'm going to show it to you. Do you see the first one? All right. All right. And then, then uh, verse 21. Verse 21. Uh, seven times more. See that? Seven times according to your sins. See that in 21? Then, then 24. Seven times for your sins. See that? Then uh, down to 28. Seven times for your sins. Now, if you know, if, if you've been around with us very long, then you know that Leviticus 26 has these five cycles, and they're, they're out there in your, in your passages. So that when you get to 28, you're in the fifth cycle. It actually starts in 27, and it, I wrote it down here just in case. And, it, and the fifth cycle goes to 39. The fifth, that's the fifth. One, two, three, four, five, fifth. But you see there's a phrase, seven times more. You see that? Seven times more. 18, 21, 24, 28, you're just going through the cycles. If you study that, you'll see you're going through the five cycles of divine discipline. When you get to the fifth, it's kaput. That's, that's when you get the fall of something, the fall of, of, to Assyria, the fall to Babylon, the fall to Rome, right? That's how the, it goes. But I'm interested in word seven. So you have a double here. It's the sabbatical, and it's... The seven of divine discipline. They went in. And remember, once it starts, said it seven times more. Once you hit the second one, if you don't repent the first, then boy, he wrenches it up, which is the way God disciplines people. It's the way he disciplines you. You know, if you read uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter 5 through 11, you will understand that God, this is the way God disciplines you. There's three levels of divine discipline on you to get you to confess your sin and get right with God. Right? Yes, he, he, and listen, he disciplines his children because he loves them. Uh, <laughs> don't you? Well, anyhow. Also, where was I? I don't know. The 70, 77s has been decreed. See that? It's been decreed. I wrote that up on your paper. This is one of the few things I did actually wrote up here. It's a nifel, and it's a perfect tense. That's what that means. Has been decreed. Now, let me tell you, and I wrote the Hebrew word. This is the eternal life conference. How do I know there's an eternal life conference? In the New Testament, you'll hear this phrase all the time. Before the foundation of the earth. That's the eternal life conference. Certain things have been decreed that are foundational doctrines uh, to history. Biblical history. They're, before the foundation, just, you know, you have a study Bible. You can look that up later. And you can study. And when you talk about that, where did that, before the foundation of the world, before creation, there were certain things decreed. See what I mean? And that, that's, when they come out, this is decreed like it is in this passage. Man, that's, that's written in concrete. Uh, and uh, so we have it. We have it in the Niphel perfect. Seventy years have been decreed. Listen, everything from where you are forward has been decreed. It's going to go just as it says, and, and we're going to be able to see the whole panorama view. All the way from the Babylonian captivity to the millennial age. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good. If I just knew what was going to happen tomorrow, well, how about every tomorrow? <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. And point number one. Now, now, now you're going to have to write a little bit. Okay? Now, we understand that the 70 years... I believe starts in 586 B.C. because of Leviticus. I believe that's Daniel 9.2. And we know a couple things about the word seven. 
it's a period of sevens. And we know why, because we know Leviticus 26 that talks about the, fifth, the five cycles of divine discipline. Divine discipline. Use this word seven in a key way. Remember also that seven in the Bible is a word for perfection. So when you got seven, 70 periods of seven, you got a max out deal. In other words, everything future in the Messianic history from the Babylonian captivity is max perfection of the outline. That's pretty good. Okay. All right. Okay, so I explained all that to you. Let's see what else I got. This word decreed in Leviticus. I want to show you something. Are, we, are you still in Leviticus? Look at, look, when he starts, he said, I'm going to lay out and show you the five cycles of discipline. It starts in verse 14. It, I'm in 26, 14. Listen to what he says. And this is the key to why you need to confess your sin. If you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commands, commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if, you, if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commands and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will point over you a sudden, and now we're into it. Okay? Now we're into it. And it's going to go all the way through the fifth cycle. Okay? Listen, this is why they're going to get this. Now, he tells them why he's going to discipline and what they have to do to recover. They weren't willing to listen. You did not listen. You did Listen, why do you suppose you listen to the Word of God to start with? To obey it. You learn it to live it. God expects that from you and me. <laughs> I know, I'm not trying to ruin your day. I'm not trying to ruin your day. I'm just trying to help you with your day. You've, you've rejected the things I've decreed. And so this becomes, this becomes a very big word. Um, you still in 26 of Leviticus? Let me show you what they could have, and this is what really fired up Daniel. This Leviticus 26, 40 through 46 fired him up. And then when you read his prayer, you can see he's read this because he knows how to pray. You know how you pray? You repeat the word of God back to God. That's 1 John 5, 14 and 15. You pray according to his will. How do I know what his will is? His word tells me what his will is. That's what God loves to hear. He loves to hear you talk his language. Look at verse 40. If they confess their iniquity, and boy, is he all over this. And you know what Daniel is doing in his prayer? He's confessing. He's an, he prays an intercessory prayer of confession for his people. Now, where do you think he got that idea? <laughs> He, he took a look. I want to know, Father, how do we get out of this mess? How do we clean ourselves up? How do we behave when we come back? And he's read this. He's read this. His faithful pastor has logged it out. He has not left his people. Listen, he's in the homeland, and his people over there, he hasn't forgotten one of them. He keeps sending them doctrine over there for them to study. And if they, if they have volition, they'll study it. guy like Daniel, been studying it since he's a little bit of kid. Listen, if they confess their iniquities and the iniquities of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they have committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them, divine discipline, to bring them into the land of their enemies, fifth cycle, or if their uncircumcised heart. You should pay attention to how many times that's used to the Jew in the, in the New Testament. And do you know what that should have meant to them? That God is, un is God is not pleased with them and is going to bring them under discipline. Jesus told them that. His disciples after Pentecost preached that message. 
Listen, this was the message that um, Stephen preached. Told him, he said, you have uncircumcised hearts and ears. It should have rung a bell to these people. It didn't. It bowed their back. They killed them. They always killed the messenger. They were, um, they were Jews with uncircumcised hearts. And listen, all of their discipline that has destroyed their nation two times over has been due to that. That rebellious heart for God against him. Listen, is eh. against God and you're going to win? Is that not stupid? Who thinks that's stupid? <laughs> oh, I think, listen, I've beat three guys I'm wrestling. Come here, God. I mean, jeez. Well, anyhow, you want to go on and read all that through verse 46 on your own because that's what God promises if they'll confess their sin and get right with him, stop fighting them and start being obedient, things are going to go well. Well, that's very important because that's, that's all part of his intercessory prayer with God. He's read up on it. He's, he's now saying, look, 70 years, come on, God. Listen, we're logging out our 70, and I'm praying that intercessory prayer of forgiveness, and I'm looking for that. I love that. I love that. Here's a, here's a passage you want to write down. You want to write down 2 Chronicles 36. And you want to go from about verse 15 through about verse 23. Because you're going to learn that too. And the wonderful part of this is God's answer to their prayer and their recovery was the Persians, Cyrus and the Persians. 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through about 23. Okay, that ought to get you there. Are you with me? Okay. Here's point number something, two. Here's point number two. Verse 25. So I'm supposed to be reading these verses to you. Here's verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from, watch the word from, to, and until. You ought to circle them. On your paper, I'm at point two, and I'm at verse 20, 25. 25. I think I said 26. I'm at 25. Are you with me? All right. Now, on your piece of paper, I want you to circle the word from. It says, so you, you are to know and discern that from. And then circle to restore. Put circle two, and then the word until Messiah. Circle those words. Those are important prepositions. Prepositions are always, always important in biblical language. Prepos prepositional phrases. Prepositional phrases are very important. So, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, it's going to come from a, uh, it's actually going to come from Cyrus, but it's going to come from a nation. From the issuing of a decree, a decree from the issuing of a decree, the decree that says to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince. See, that's out of Isaiah, you know, the prince of peace business. There will be seven, seven, and 62. That's how I put them on the board. So what you got in the 49 up there is the rebuilding, and the 49, right? We got 49 up here. That's going to be with the decree to go back. That's all, that's Ezra and Nehemiah. You want to study it, there it is. Ezra and Nehemiah going back and rebuilding. That's that first seven. And then the, the 62 we'll talk about in a moment. Because when we get to the, when we get to the, 7 plus 62, which makes 69, the Messiah has come and going to die on a cross. The 7 and 62. Okay, I'll get that in a moment. So, we're talking about the seven sevens, 
it will be built again, even under times of distress. All you got to do is read Nehemiah. If you want to know what the times of distress is, read Ezra and Nehemiah, and it will be explained. All right. So we got to 7 times 7, 49. That's the restoring. That's a decree that's going to come from a ruling nation. It happens to be Persia. That's going to allow them to go back home and to restore and rebuild and do all that. Okay? And he's going to be pro. He's going to help them build back everything, the temple, return all the stuff. I mean, it, and they entered into the golden age. Then you got 7 times 62. Four thirty-four. That's that period from that restoration into Christ coming, incarnation, all the way through the incarnation. And you got one. Listen, you got all kinds of governments. You got the you got the Persians. You got the Greco Macedonians, and then you got the Romans. All in that period are going to come in. And they're all going to have different views, but the one who has a good view towards Israel and the later a good view towards Christ are going to do well. And those who don't, they're going to get the hammer put to them because God rules nations. Oh, please, please, please understand that. That's Genesis 10 and 11. I mean, that's, that's when dirt was created. All right. So, from the Babylonian captivity, when you add that up, then you come to the time of Christ. You come to the time of Christ. Let me see if I have anything else up here. Um, you really have to understand now. Look, you're going to have to go back and do a little reading, and you'll like it. I, I don't <laughs> I used, to have a, I, used to have a past, I used to have a teacher, a seminary teacher, that would tell me, never tell people what they should enjoy. <laughs> uh, anyhow. Uh, chapter 2, you're going to have the head of gold, Babylon. You're going to have the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persians. You're going to have the belly and thigh of bronze, that's going to be the Greco Macedonian. And you're going to have, and you really pay attention now, because this is our history. Pay attention to the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. But that's the fourth kingdom, that's Rome. And the toes are important to us. Okay? You can read about that in the second chapter. And there's another thing you want to pay attention to in the second chapter. In the second chapter, all of a sudden, a stone is going to come, a rock is going to smash the feet and going to destroy the whole system. And that rock is Christ. And that's the second coming. And you want to pay attention to that when you get to the second chapter from about verse 40 through 45. That is so good. The rock <laughs> struck the statue, statue and it became, it, it shattered it to pieces and the stone became the Bible says, and the stone became a mighty mountain that filled the whole earth. <laughs> and you, can't, you cannot imagine how many times Christ is referred to as the rock in the Bible. In chapter 7, when he gives, that's four kingdoms in chapter 2. He's going to come back in chapter 7, and Nebuchadnezzar's son is on the throne of Babylon in chapter 7, and he has to explain again to another ruler of Babylon. This time he uses, he describes the four kingdoms by four animals. All right? So we have the, 
uh, if I, we have the lion, and they're in order the same way. We have the lion that's going to be Babylon, and we have the bear and the leper. And then we get to the fourth kingdom, which is going to be Rome, and he talks about a beast that I can't quite describe what he is. He's not this and he's not that. He's just a weirdo. Yeah, that's, that's, well, we can't identify it. That's what we do, don't we? Just a weirdo. But that's really interesting in chapter 7, so it would be well worth your time, somewhere or another, to read about Rome, because Rome is part of our history. Uh, not, not literally in the church, but the revived Roman Empire is a big deal to the second coming. Now, point three. In verse 26, it says that after. Now, that is so important that I wrote it out in the Hebrew. Again, you read from the right to the left. This, this little deal that looks like this, a line down and two dots, that's a conjunction. That's a conjunction. And the rest of the word is a preposition. This word could be an adverb or a preposition, but this is a preposition translated properly, then, after, or afterward. Then after... 62, right? After the 62, that now we're down here. We've had the 7, yep. And now we've had the 62, yep. You with me? Okay. So we're at 69. The Messiah will be cut off. The Messiah, the Messiah will be crucified. The Messiah will be crucified. The Messiah, this will be a big major event. The Messiah will be crucified. And the people of the prince, that is the Roman Empire, the prince is going to be the one that comes out of it, the Antichrist, who is to come, we will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the Antichrist, the people first, that is Rome, will destroy, will destroy the temple that is during the time of Christ. Did they do it? Oh, yeah, 70 A.D. You know why? Because they crucified their Messiah. Jeez, how could they do that? Talk about unto lunch. Holy catfish. Its end will come forth with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war, desolations, and, de and determined. Desolation, and desolations are determined. So, what we have in this is we have Israel still under the fifth, but has been released to go back home. They are still under the fifth as far as having a king to sit on their throne. There will never be a king because of the curse of Coniah written in Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah. They're under the curse of Coniah. The next king that will sit on the throne will be Christ himself in the millennium. Yeah, that's so good. So good. I want to study it. We're going to study all this. I'm just giving you what sneak preview. Okay? So what we have, and of course Rome will be here, the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom of this prophecy will be over that crucifixion. And if you want to study current history for us, Christianity, you study Roman history after the crucifixion, who, who God raises up in Roman history after the crucifixion, and see how God changed the heart of that nation for the church to be evangelical through the whole world. And Paul followed the Roman map all the way through Europe. All the way. Just took the Roman map and just, because of the Pax Romana. Pax Romana. And once again, 
God, when he wanted to discipline him, he put a tough guy in. When he wanted to release him, he turned the whole flip on him. It's the most marvelous thing you could ever study in the whole wide world is to watch the Roman emperors, uh, their hearts change towards Israel and towards the church. Especially the church. Uh, every once in a while, God had put fire under them, but it's enormous. It's a great study. It is in this time of Rome that we have the incarnation, right? Where, where, do, where does Joseph and Elizabeth, under whose rulership, does Roman and, and uh, 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 Joseph and Mary? My wife always says, when you get, you get too excited, you get, you get, your words get kind of crazy, so just calm down. <laughs> I hate it when it works. Get calm down. Okay, now tell us. Joseph and Mary. It was, it was Augustus. Great emperor. Great emperor to the church. Never once in a while, God has to raise up somebody like Nero just to get the church back in line. It's always for good purposes, people. Amen. We ought to know that by now if we know anything else. And, and Rome... Rome, Rome will disappear. Western civilization will come in. I hope Canape is all over this. Is going to come in and boom, 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 right? Every second, fourth Saturday, he's talking about Christianity and what. Do you know what Rome did? Rome set up Europe for Western Europe. Do you know who made it? The the church. Good and bad. Ever ever once they get bad, and God has put fire under them, weed them out. Well, I'll tell you, pretty good stuff, pretty good stuff. And Rome is described with iron teeth. Boy, that's a, uh, holy cow, iron teeth. He said, iron teeth that can crush and devour. Boy, that was them. And, of course, out of Rome is going to come the ten kingdoms, and out of the ten kingdom is going to come the Antichrist. He's going to absorb three of them, and the, the little horn's going to come out, which is Antichrist, and then we're in the tribulation, people. <laughs> oh, in the book of Daniel, 24, 25, 26, 27, I got all that. That's hard to believe, ain't it? How's that happen? Because I got a wonderful group of people that pay my salary, love me, stay home, and study. Thank you. So happy for that. But make no mistake about it. Between the 69th week and the 70th, which is the tribulation, great last seven years, there's a gap. There's a historical gap, a messianic gap, and that's called the mystery of the church. Hoo-ah. Now we know we're a mystery. Right? Johnny, good to have you. You look so normal sitting there. Normal. Well, hey boy, for one time I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to let that go. I'll let your words speak for themselves, Johnny. But anyhow, this is the mystery of the church. This period is the mystery of the church. And when that mystery is raptured, we're going to go into it. Right? We're going into it. Then we're going to jump back into this last seven years that we call the tribulation. Verse 27. And he, the Antichrist, the little horn of the Roman Empire, we call it the dictator of the revived Roman Empire. Somewhere I've got that. If you see a D-R-R-E. Where, where is that, Don? Beginning of the Oh, I put that in there. I didn't put it on my paper. Um, before I left for a house for church, John Dyer called me. He said, I know I should know this. What's the D-R-R-E? Because nobody where we're sending this paper will ever know what that is. I guess that's how long it's been since I've taught on eschatology. And he, the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, is what that stands for. That You would probably call it the Antichrist. The dictator, revived Roman Empire, the little horn, the dictator. He will make a firm covenant with them for one week, that's seven, seven years, 
the seven, that's, remember, you remember the word seven is a period of sevens. But in the middle of that sevens, at that seven years, he will put a stop to sacrifice grain offerings and will set himself up as the abomination and the rest is. Now you want to read more about this. You can jump ahead if you'd like. And you can read Revelation 19 and 20. Yeah. And see the word decree? This is interesting because that word, I didn't have a chance to write it in the Hebrew, but that word decree is different than the one I began with. In fact, this word in the Hebrew, uh, C-H-A-R-A-T-S, C-H-A-R-A-T-S, this word in the Hebrew is talking about a specific decree for a, spe a specific occasion. It's a different Hebrew word than the other one. And, and he's talking about now we're narrowing it right down, and the Antichrist is going to do this. He's going to set himself in what we call the abomination of desolation. Uh, and the one that is decreed is poured out on the one who has made desolation. That's the second advent of Christ. He's going to come back, and he's going to pound him good. <laughs> and so all the people say it, good. Well, as far as I can get tonight, aren't you happy? That's as far as I can get. Now, of course, we're going to study this in more detail. Uh, you know, we're going to study this in, in more details of doctrines and eschatology. I don't know how many more, but a few. A few. And uh, this should work along with Kirk. Where was Kirk last week? I, didn't, I don't have a chance to get in. Anybody in here? What, where was he last week? Where did he get to? He got into the early days of the Roman Empire. The early days. He covered a, a few of the early uh, emperors. Good. Good. Up to Nero. Up to Nero. Good. Good. Well, good. That's going to be very helpful. He did not cover sacking of the Jerusalem. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that would be important. The fifth cycle would be a very, a very important aspect of Roman history. It, it's, uh, it is setting up the final stage. The, the next stage, the next stage in Messianic history is the tribulation, the second coming. Boom. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a great study on the Roman Is it? Boy, it's been so long since I've studied the Fox's Book of Martyrs. That is really a good book. What, what's it called? It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a really good book. It's really good. I, 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 can you still get that book? I don't know. No, I don't know. I we probably library. have one in the library, though. But I got it. Yeah, so it's it's available, apparently. I would think it would still be. It's still a hot seller. Okay, let's let's have a word of prayer. We can let the Internet people leave, and then we'll have our personal prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for all that have attended this study, both by automobile and internet, those who are on the internet, you know, if they get a hard copy, they're going to have to get the video. There is no way they will understand with all that gap space in there that can only be filled by the... So I encourage you that if you pop in on that, that you're going to find vacant, vacant spots and they can only be filled in, and they can be, and they will be, but you have to go to the, the video. So let me encourage you to do that if you're interested in this subject matter. And then uh, tune in with us uh, for what is called the teachings on the last day of eschatology that comes from this. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.